one of my favorite portions of scripture is the prelude to the premise of the message I would like to preach. Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. It's funny that God would have to remind us that he is not devising evil things towards us. God is not the author of evil in your life. When bad occurs, God can use those things, but he is not contemplating evil. It's not in him to do that. Then, verse 12, ye shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart Amen. you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart I want to preach this message to you this morning that aha moment that aha moment relax say aha so in the name of Jesus would you anoint the preaching of your word help me today to deliver the word that you gave me to your people in Jesus name I pray and everyone said amen Clap your hands to him one more time. You may be seated. I need to beg your pardon this morning. I'm going to be very personal and tell some personal stories. My message today will rely heavily on my personal journey of discovery. I am 49 years old. I know you thought I was in my 20s, but it's deceiving. And early in my life, after my mother divorced and separated her third husband, there I began a journey of discovery, a digging, a longing. I had seen enough by 10, 11, and 12 to know this is not the life I want to live. God had helped me somehow to figure out that I had a great example of what not to do and what not to be. And so my journey allowed me to, to, to question what I thought to be the answer, which was, of course, religion. And, and I would go to religion classes, and, and I, would, I would ask my teachers questions. And without getting the, a good enough response, I thought I would go to the people above them and so I would go to the ministers, and, and, and they would not give me an adequate response. And this led to more frustration and also increased my hunger. And the hunger and the curiosity carried me through the confusion and the frustration. The hunger kept me whenever I got distracted, whenever bad things happened, the hunger kept me coming. Let me just pause for a second to tell you this. One of the greatest gifts God could ever give you is a hunger for him. I'm not talking about a, a simple desire for God. I'm talking about an appetite, an insatiable. I'm talking like a Cade Romero appetite. I have so picked it. Cade, Cade comes to my house and invades our pantry. It always begins with an innocent enough nonky. Can I? And it always involves food. He wants some of my English tea, or he wants to make a sandwich, or he sees there's an extra ribeye, or whatever. Cade eats. That is why he has a weight problem. A hunger is something that you're blessed with. A hunger and a desire will keep you when everybody else drops off the wayside. You'll remain focused if your passion for God is red hot, white hot, passionate. 
I'm staying, I'm staying, I'm staying. Jesus Christ would honor that by in the Beatitudes writing in Matthew 5, blessed are they which do hunger. If you are hungering after God, he said, you're blessed. Yes. This constant digging and searching and longing would lead me to West Jefferson Street where I would meet up with Lynn Estes' husband, Jonathan. Where are you, Sister Lynn? I was just a teenage boy, 13, 14 years old, and John Estes was on a journey also. And so he and I would go in his bedroom, and we would listen to tapes of preachers preaching. And then John Estes had a harpsichord. It looked like a little harp. It had a wooden backing, and he'd put little picks on his fingers, and he'd strum it. And then he had an electronic harpsichord where he could just strum the electrodes with his thumb, and he would play music, and we would sing, and we would pray together. It was awesome. I remember one time another friend of mine named David came to my house. I wasn't even in the church yet. I was just digging, and we prayed and prayed and prayed until the Spirit of God fell on the house, and we were both speaking in tongues. It was, it was, it was amazing what was going on. God was doing an amazing, I was just a kid. I was digging, I was searching. I remember getting confused about who God was and, and, and trying to pray to God. And I thought, well, I, I'm talking to God the Father and I need to pray to God the Son, I thought. And, and if I spend 10 minutes talking to those two, I can't leave out the Holy Ghost. And I, 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 I had a hard time envisioning what the Holy Ghost looked like, whether it was Casper the friendly ghost, but that looked funny in my head. And I know it sounds funny, but as a boy, you're, you're, I'm, I'm sincere and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reach out to God. I'm just longing. And let me tell you something. No matter what your version of God is, if you'll just begin to go towards him, God has a funny way of working things out for you. If you think God's a teapot, if you're hungry enough, you'll get beyond the teapot. You'll get beyond whatever idol you're worshiping, and one day you'll find out who he is. Because the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. I remember debating my stepmother over the Godhead. Oh, how the Lord used my stepmother. I would visit church and Brother Lorman would preach on the Godhead and I'd see a little bit of who Jesus was. I understood then for a little bit of who I was talking to and I'd come home and my stepmother would give me a verse of scripture that would mess me up. Little did I know that God was using her to train me to develop my understanding of the word. Let me tell you something. Just because somebody asks you a question you can't answer, don't let that shake your faith. Make that push you back to the word of God. Get your answers from the book. Don't get it from your religion. Don't get it from your pastor. Get it from the book because the word is right. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The answer is in the word. We have too many people who will take other people's words for the word. When you know someone only through what other people say about them, then you only know them through gossip. And if you only know Jesus Christ through the words that some preacher says, then you only know God through gossip. You need to know him for yourself. You need to talk to him for yourself. And the way you learn him is through his word. Clap your hands to the Lord. I remember aha moments. I remember when the light came on aha moments inspire they create impact you don't forget them aha moments create enthusiasm i've never lost that enthusiasm i've never lost it you call it what you want it's a gift the word enthusiasm i've had people tell me this well i'm not like you clifton i'm not as enthusiastic as you i've heard that before if i had your enthusiasm you're, you're just so enthusiastic. That, that word got thrown at me a whole lot early on in my walk with God. And it was as though they were exempt from being excited about God because I had this gift of enthusiasm and they did not. Now, not everybody is going to be ball-headed, bow-legged, flat-footed, left-handed like me. I got that. I'm not trying to make you a mini-me, but I will tell you this about enthusiasm. The more I heard the word enthusiasm thrown at me, the more I began to dig at the word enthusiasm. Guess what? The root word of enthusiasm is T-H-E-U-S, theus. It comes from the word theology or theos, which is where we get the word God from. And the prefix E-N means possession of. The word enthusiasm means possession of God. 
Yes, I'm enthusiastic. And you would be too if you knew whose property you were. I know who owns me. What know ye not that ye are not your own, that you're bought with a price? Yeah. A lack of enthusiasm is usually due to a lack of, a lack of aha moments. An aha moment. What is that? It's a moment of sudden insight. A moment of discovery. It's when someone tells you the joke and you don't get it. And then you go, ah, right? That's why Cajuns have flat heads and sharp necks. You ask them a question and they go, me, I don't know. And when you tell them the question, the answer, oh, I should have known that. Okay, joke flopped. I won't use it again. Until you have that aha moment, you don't get it. I'm convinced a lot of people don't get it. I'm convinced a lot of people, this is just their flavor of the day. This, this gospel, this, this Jesus thing, this, this, this has never gotten old. I've gone through seasons in life, we all have. But my passion for God is based on an aha moment that happened to me. I was on a journey. I was lost. I was undone. I knew I wasn't going to be right. I knew there was more to God. And that caused me to dig and dig and dig. It caused me to go against my mother and my father. It caused me to go against my friends and all my peers. I kept digging because I wanted him. I didn't want to just know about him. I wanted to know him. And when I found him, I sold all. The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in a field and he sold all that he had and he purchased the field. He bought the field because the treasure was in the field. Let me tell you something. You get more than the kingdom of God when you go after the kingdom of God. There's other things that had come along that you didn't bargain for. I didn't realize there was going to be gossip and division. I didn't realize I was going to get hurt and wounded. That's all right. That's all a part of the field. But what's in the field is the treasure. You know what the treasure is? It's what's beneath the surface. you got to dig deeper than people's gossip, than people's problems, and people's pain. Because the treasure is in the field. Confused. Not knowing who to talk to, who to pray to. And then one night, I remember on a cold, cold night, we were sitting in the old block building on the south campus on Curtis Street. Many of you were there, or some of you were there. The top two or three rows of center block weren't yet finished. Our pews were nothing more than two by eights on a, on a center block. And Brother Lorman had illegally put a kerosene coal lantern in the back heater. It was blowing. And I was so confused about who God was and who to talk to when I prayed. And then one night, I'll never forget it. He begins reading from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There it is, son. And whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God. Say the image. He is the image of the invisible God. <clears throat> on my phone, I happen to have several images. If I was to hold this up and say, who is this? If you were to say Clifton and Paula, you would be correct. If I say, who is this? You say Clifton and Paula, you would be correct. If I point to this woman and to myself and say, who is this? You could say Clifton and Paula and you would be correct. So how many of me are there? Is there just us two or is there actually two sets of us? I could bring to you thousands of images of Cliff and Paula. And when you pointed to each one of them, they would all be correct by you saying that's Cliff and Paula. But there's only one Clifton and there's only one Paula. All of those are images of Cliff and Paula. He read that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. When he said it, I saw it. Oh, my God. Jesus Christ is the image of God. That's why he could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How sayest thou, then show us the Father. He's the image of God. He's the image of God. If I take this phone like I did this past week and drop it and shatter the screen, and it distorts the image that's on the screen, does it affect me at all? By 100 bucks. But it doesn't affect my health. If, I, if you take a knife 
if you take a spear, if you take hammer and nails and drive it through this image of Paula and I, Will it hurt Paula and I? No. When God, when Jesus Christ was on the cross and they crucified him, they crucified the image of God because you can't kill God. I know this may not mean much to you, but whenever it's a young man trying to understand who God is and all of a sudden you get revelation, you have your aha moment. Hey, I see it, Dad. I see it. That's what I said. He goes, oh, church. I said, no, you don't understand. I see it. I see who he is. He kept reading. He read on down in verse 16 where it says all things were created by him and for him. In verse 19, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Then he went to Colossians 2 and 8 and 9. In verse 9 it said, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I remember that moment. I remember, that, I remember where I was sitting. I was sitting on the left side looking at the ch platform on the left side of the sanctuary. Not far from that kerosene thing maybe two rows from the from the back and whenever brother Norman read those verses the light came on say the light came on the light came on and when the light came on katie bar the door <laughs> i see it now i see it you need to have your own aha moment when you lose the wonder you lose the one This applies to your marriage. When you lose the wonder, you will lose the one. You got to work at the wonder. Can I have an amen? I, I, I can't let this get old. I can't let this get drab. I don't care who likes it, who doesn't like it, who says it ain't real, didn't do any good for them. I don't care. I had my own aha moment. The light came on for me. See, according to the scripture, it takes revelation. Luke 10 and 22 says, all things are delivered to me of my father. And no man knoweth who the son is but the father, and who the father is but the son, and he to whom the son will reveal him. If you're going to know the father, it will be an aha moment provided by the son. It takes revelation. It takes revelation. Say revelation. You need to seek God until you get revelation. You seek him in his word. Clap your hands to the Lord. I'm going to skip a couple verses, media, and I'm going to Isaiah 51. How do I keep the aha alive? How do I keep this aha moment? How do I, how do I keep it alive in me to where it doesn't get old, it doesn't get dead? The prophet Isaiah said like this, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. That's the key. That's the key. Do you remember the pit God dug you out of? Clifton does. You've heard me pastor for 22 years, so you know my story. There's nothing I can tell you. If I start talking about the sonic aluminum sonic tray and the zigzags, you know all that already. You know about the weed. You know about Bob Seeger and the Silver Bullet Band and, and mom going off with her friends and they're at T. Georges and, and probably the Red Rose where she probably saw Rita Landry. Where's Rita Landry? Party girl right there. She had no idea that she was partying with her future pastor's family. Way, way back in the day. I'm, I'm digging, I'm searching. What's going on? I remember what it's like to be lost. Look to the pit from whence you people backslide because they forget the pit. They forget what it's like to not know God. Before I received the Holy Ghost, before his spirit inhabited me, I know, I know the feeling of losses. I, I remember what life was like. I remember where I came from. I remember what it was like before he found me. You know, that, the expression, aha, you get in your brain a light bulb, right? A light going off. The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. You and I, it's our aha moment that brings light to the world. Cade, where are you, buddy? I'm talking about you a lot today. You just happen to be in my notes. Cade works for Bill Navarre, as does Chris Eason, and as does my other nephew, uh, Justin Welch. Cade has been working to sell an automobile. He works for Bill Navarre, and they sell Chevrolet, Honda, Hyundai, 
in Cadillac. Hadn't sold any cars. But the other day, he finally made a sale. Yay, Cade. Did he sell a Cadillac? Nope. Did he sell a Chevrolet? Just wait. Let me tell you what he sold most handily and most easily. He sold a Honda. You know how Cade sells Honda? Cade owns a Honda. Cade drives a Honda. Cade uses a Honda. And that takes me to Frederick J. Eichenren Coetter, better known as Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike was born in June of 1935, died July of 2009. He was an American minister and evangelist based in New York City. He's best known for a slogan. He simply said it like this, you can't lose with the stuff I use. <laughs> you can't lose with the stuff I use. He was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't lose with the stuff I use. I like that. You can't, listen to me, until you begin to use this gospel, until it becomes yours, until you use it, it's not yours. You can't sell something you don't believe in. So Bubba Lejeune, where are you? Bubba. Brother Bubba. Brother Bubba. His real name is Jonathan. You don't have to be around him long to know what line of vehicles he believes in. He drives a circa 1980 sharp wheelbase fleet side Chevrolet pickup that was previously owned by his uncle. He's in the process of a complete restore. You ask, to what degree does he believe in this General Motors product? All you need to do is ask the name of his son. Where is Dotson? I mean Nissan. I mean Ford. I mean Pontiac. I mean Porsche. What is his name? Chevy. He believes in the product so much, he named his son Chevy. <laughs> Too bad you didn't like the Yugo. <laughs> You're going to get me some. <laughs> you cannot sell what you don't believe in, and you will not sell what you don't believe in. Oh, you might find someone that's already in the market for whatever it is you're peddling, but you're not going to be successful being a purveyor of passionless products. You have to believe in it. The spirit of Laodicea is the spirit of familiarity. The greatest tragedy is when you go from aha to ho-hum. I've seen it in people's eyes. When they first come to church, they're like this. Or, or like this. <laughs> After a while, the transition, if they've never been around this, is like, and then, then they, get, they, get a little, they get a little, you know, courage. And, but they're afraid if they do that, that means, hey, come pick me, all you, all the octopi. <laughs> they want to pray, but they don't want nobody to come touch them, you know. And, and then before long, before long, they just kind of don't care anymore. Miss Tracy, they, they, just, they just start worshiping. They just, they just come and they raise their hands and it's just awesome. To see it, to see it happen, to see the transition. And then, and then the sad thing is to watch them. People go from that, that glow of, of new, that freshness, that aha, to ho-hum. Boy, they just get used to it. Where it's just another, another one of those things. Their attitude transforms from yearning to yawning. When it comes to the plan of salvation, I had the same, the same passion. I was so excited about my walk with God. I was, I was so, when I, when I saw it, when I saw the Holy, when I saw what the Bible teaches, oh man, oh man, I, I grabbed the Bible. My dad bought me a Bible. It happens to be this exact one. If you come to my house, this Bible is on my bed. But I'm not the only one who used this Bible. I had an associate in high school who helped me preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would my associate please come help me? Would you make welcome my associate, please? <clears throat> this is what happened in high school. I received the Holy Ghost in January of 1983. Brother Ricky, what year did you, when did you receive the Holy Ghost? 1984. 1984. And what month was it, remember? April. In April of 84. So about a year and months, a few months later, Ricky gets the Holy Ghost. And so we are at high school. It's still 
high school. We're, we're freshmen and sophomores in high school. <clears throat> Between classes, hang on a second before I tell that story. We, we would be in English class and they're handing out parts to read out loud for a play. And there's only two speaking parts that have cuss words in it. And guess who got the two speaking parts with cuss words? Amen. Clifton and Ricky. So we're looking ahead. Miss Carmier was a teacher. We're looking ahead and he's looking, he's looking at me. He goes, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. You remember what we did? <laughs> when we got to the part, I think I was the first, I don't know, remember, maybe not. When I got to the part that had a cuss word, I got to that cuss word and, <clears throat> and read through it. Ricky picked up. So when he got to his part, he'd read, get to the cuss word, <clears throat> he'd cough, and we coughed our way through cussing. These are 14-year-old teenagers who don't know that God is using these circumstances to cut our spiritual teeth, to give us a resolve and a passion that's going to last us a lifetime. Yeah. That 33 years later, we're still going to be in the house of God, still going to be living for God. Our wives are going to be here. Our kids are going to be our grandkids. Yeah. And so in between class. We'd go from class to class, and we had a little three-minute break. In the break, we'd be in between classes, and Ricky would hold that Bible for me, like my podium or my pulpit. And I would preach to the kids in the gym. They would be in the gymnasium. Murphy Lewis was there, a bunch of them. They'd sit there. If I'm crying, God would anoint me and use me while we were preaching this beautiful gospel. Ricky, do you remember what we used to preach? Max. Yes, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto him, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I was 14 years old, hungry, had a void in my life. I'm telling you, every one of us in here have a void in our life. And when I seen that and I had my aha moment and God filled me with the Holy Ghost at 14 in my bedroom on Jefferson Street, hands lifted high, nobody praying for me, nobody laying hands on me, my aha moment did it for me. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as heaven came down in my bedroom. I got up from that place and I got on that telephone and I called all my friends. I called Cliff. I called Brother Carol Wayne Dunn. I said, man, I got the Holy Ghost in my bedroom. I went back to school the next day. The first thing one of our friends told us, Todd Smith, he said, something is different about you. What happened to you? And this man right here began to preach the gospel to him again. We had no idea what God was doing, but we both had had an aha moment. It was so real. Listen, I'm so desperately hungry to see some 12 and 13 year olds in this church get that kind of passion for God where it's not just in a youth service, but they begin to carry their Bible to school, begin to walk around carrying it in their hand so that somebody will ask, hey, what's that? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. It's got to be more than our religion. Clap your hands one more time to the Lord. He finds a woman at a well. He ministers to her. And she leaves. She goes into the city and she finds some men. If you know her story, that would have been pretty easy for her. But this time she's not soliciting them. She says to them, come and see a man which told me all things that whatever I did, is this not the Christ? Come and see a man. Jesus was investing. He's a wise investor. When he met the woman, she was at a well drawing water. But when he invested her, when she left, she drew interest. I'm telling you, he's a wise investor. That's why he's invested his truth in you. He wants you to draw interest for him. Yeah. Clap your hands to the Lord. It was the Bible bus at the parish fairgrounds. And so... Again, still red hot on fire for God. And we hop on the Bible bus. And the preacher on the Bible bus, he told those kids all they had to do was believe on the Lord and they'd be saved. And I raised my hand. I said, what about John 3 and 5? I'm just a kid. He looked at me. I said, John, Jesus said, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. His next words to me were, get off my bus. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I'm going to be where they are. Church, it is time for you to turn, for us to turn our eyes towards the harvest. We've been here long enough. This is home. This isn't new anymore. This is home. What do you say we pack this place out? What do you say we share what we've got with others? So I want to equip you. If you go to the church's website, jesusworshipcenter.com, and if you will go to there, there's a tab at the top that says media. Now, I know it's small, but you can click, just point to media. And once you click on media, you go down to the very last item. It says home Bible study guides. This is a free resource. If you click on that, you'll get these, this screen. It shows two clickable items, home Bible study teacher edition, home Bible study student edition. These are PDF files. You download them, and now you can teach the word of God to anybody. Familiarity breeds contempt. I believe we can become so accustomed to him, to his word, to his house, to his people, to his presence, that we treat all of it as though we're nothing more than any other church, religion, or experience. In the summer of 1996, I took a trip with our youth group to Astroworld. I noticed something strange there. We were at Astroworld, which was a great amusement park in Houston, Texas. It's no longer there. It's a place where fantasy became reality. It's a place where they had rides just that would thrill you. That you could see Batman and Robin in action. Maybe not Adam West and Burt Ward, but two other actors who would put on the costume and make you believe they were real. And this is the place where children could fly airplanes that were owned by Sylvester the Cat. You could drive cars that were owned off of the Speedy Gonzales used car lot. And you could fly in a spaceship used by Martians and view carrots in Bugs Bunny's personal garden. Here, big kids can have their minds bent on the Mayan mind bender. And if you love bad weather, you could ride the Texas Cyclone or the Greased Lightning. And there's even an Ultra Twister and a Tidal Wave. All of this, you may remember, was at Astral World. All of those rides were meant to thrill you and to make you feel things you could not feel anywhere else. But the thing that amazed me most was not the people. The customers that were there were all smiling and giggling and laughing and screaming and having a blast. But the workers, the workers were another story entirely. I saw people that ran the ride called the Batman, which was a roller coaster where the passengers would stand up. I saw a woman there literally hanging her head with her bottom lip sagging as though she was in a fit of depression or discouragement. The gatekeepers at the entrance of Astroworld appeared as if they were pallbearers at their mother's funeral. The attendees at several rides were there just for a paycheck. No smile, no joy, no life, no nothing. I'm not talking about older people who've been experiencing all this. I'm talking about teenagers and people in their 20s. You go to a public school, you'll see the life sucked out of kids in the second, third, and fourth grade. No joie de vie, no passion. What's going on? You cannot allow that to happen to your walk with God. You have to be the steward of it. You got to keep stoking the flames. You got to keep coming back and hearing this. You come here, you feel it, ooh, and then you go away. Listen, it's the hot poker principle. How does a hot poker become a hot poker? You stick it in the fire. If you want to stay on fire, you got to keep coming where the fire is. That's it. I'm coming to a close. Edie, would you come, honey? In 2001, I had a New Year's Eve message, that, a creative word the Lord had given me. Eve in the Bible was Adam's wife. He was the first woman. She, excuse me, she was the first woman. And the church is the bride. Adam was the groom. Eve was the bride. The Bible calls Jesus Christ the last Adam, and that makes his bride the last Eve. So that year... My message was simply this. Instead of having a message for the New Year's Eve, why don't we have a new Eve for the year? 
See, my, my, my principle was this. If you knew him, he'd knew you. If you, K-N-E-W, if you knew him, he would N-E-W, he would knew you. Renewed. Renewed burden. Renewed passion. Moms, dads, you get bored with this, you can't expect your kids to be excited about it. It's not, do we have to go to church? We get to go to church. church is a lot of work for Paula and Clifton and Eden and Aaron and maybe that's the key maybe the key really is you got to be involved to evolve it's all they've known Eden and Aaron if it ever happens that I'm no longer pastor and they live in another city I can assure you they will not be sitting on a pew listening to sermons being preached they will find their way into the kingdom of God they will work their way and get involved they'll assist the pastor they'll do something I gotta this is how you grow in your walk with God you do not grow sitting and absorbing ministry you grow by being involved in kingdom business okay so I told you I'm 49 that means tomorrow I mean next year I'll be 50 right and so the expression is when you turn 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever the expression is you're over the the hill you're over the hill you're too young to even know what the expression is Aaron shut your mouth she said over the hump <laughs> yes dad hears all you're over the hill there'll be black balloons with bright shiny letters saying over the hill you're over the hill it's all over it's all downhill no more fun no more discovery no more joy there is a hill if you ever get over it that's exactly what's going to happen the hill was a place called Calvary the hill of the skull the place of the skull Golgotha was another term if you ever get over that hill you will lose the discovery you'll lose the passion you'll lose the fun I've never gotten over the hill Let's stand. You gotta have an aha moment. You remember whenever you first felt it? That life that there's hope for me. Satan has whispered in your ear, you've done too much. Too late. You've gone too far. If these people knew what you were, where you've been, what you've done. I want to tell you something. You can still find your aha moment. Your father knows all of that about you. All of it. He never has an aha moment. <laughs> Has it ever dawned on you that nothing ever dawns on God? He, he never goes, look at there, who'd have thunk? He knows it all. The beautiful part about that is he knows everything about me. He knows every sin I have committed and the ones I quite possibly may commit in the future. He loved me and you in spite of all of that. Never lose your aha. If you want God to use you to reach somebody else, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, it's a fellow employee, you want God to use you to reach somebody else, I want you in this altar. So Kate had five weeks of training, I think. Chris, didn't you have the same? Go through that training? Okay. So Cade, you know, man, he's, he's out the gate. He can finally be on the sales floor. He can make sales. Day one, he sells a total of zero cars. Day two, he sells a total of 
zero cars. So the manager, after a few days, comes down on this case. You know, I ain't making enough phone calls. Da -da -da. Just, just, just choose them out. Just gets on them. Just, you gotta, and he's doing everything he, that he's been taught to do. He memorized all the scripts, doing all he's supposed to do. It ain't happening. So you know what he does? He hangs the lip and quits his job. Forget that. I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing all I know what to do. That preacher, every time I come to church, it's all I hear. K stay at Bill and Navarre. I don't know how long he's going to be there. It doesn't matter to me. He stayed there, and guess what he did? If that's the case, then the next day he called twice as many people. He said, how many appointments you, you set that day and no one showed up? Six appointments. He set six appointments, and absolutely zero out of six showed up for those appointments. So you know what he did? You can take this job and throw it away. Nope. He stayed. He stayed getting no results. He stayed having a boss, a pastor, excuse me, whatever the case may be, just on him and on him and on him because he believed if I just keep on, if I just keep on, somebody's going to come around. If I just keep on. It was two years or a year that Hunter and Charlie kept on pestering Josh Sonye. And now Josh Sonye is married to the woman of his dreams, the mother of his child. He's in the house of God. His mother-in-law is here. Sister-in-law is here. Heidi's here. The bicycling queen. What Heidi had to overcome to get here, the negative things that she was told about us, the lies that have been spread about us. Every time I hear those kinds of stories, it's just it's like a trophy to me. <laughs> Satan hates us. He hates what's going on here. And the only way people are going to know about it is if someone from this place goes out there and says, uh -huh, man, I've got something. Oh, my God. You just got to see for yourself. I heard they handle snakes. Well, come see if they handle snakes or not. We were told that this week. It's a church that handles snakes. What? Are you kidding me? We've dealt with a lot of devils, but not any snakes of late. Not if I'm the pastor. There's no snakes, I can assure you. Stayed and stayed. So now you've got one and a half, two out, two cars sold. Two cars sold. After no car sold, no car sold, no car sold. Being told, no, 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 you, you, can't, you, cannot, you cannot sell. You can't go out there and look, man, look, dude, it's, it's the end of the month. If you, don't, if you don't buy this hunk of junk, you know, I ain't going to make my quota. You can't go out and invite people, look, uh, my pastor made me come out here. Look, I got this ignorant little card. I got a poker chip for you. Look, I got a big poker chip, little poker chip. Just, you know, he preached about the hot poker. I don't know what he was talking about, gambling, whatever. But if you don't come, he's going to keep on talking about this and he's going to make me feel bad. Would you just, you're not going to get anybody. Dude, 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 dude. We're on bicycles riding and the girls, here we go. If, if I see somebody, we're talking. We're talking. Hey, man, just, just talk. Talk. Sell it. Carry this around. Invite them. Hey, hey, this is what you need. Had a woman at my house this week at the wedding. Josh and Heidi performed their wedding and a woman told me that she had a man Keith Wall's dad Keith Wall's dad was at Calvary Baptist Church and went and knocked on her door for two years she told me two years every Thursday knocked on her door she said we we would hide we wouldn't answer we would leave for two years to avoid this man she said finally we just couldn't take it. we're just gonna go to make him leave us alone two years and she finally went. And when she went, she got in and she stayed in. You, you, how many people are just needing that? They're going to say no the first time. Fine. But if you've had that aha moment and you believe in it, so what? Come back again. Ask him again. Keep asking. Keep asking. 16 years I asked for my mom. And she came in in the 16th year.